Welcome to Yellow Guest is in Honorees. Again, we have my very musical host, co host of Michael Pardon, and I'm Matthew Ross. This is episode five. We're looking at Star Trek's The Enemy Within. How are we doing tonight, Mike? Thought that we could connect without so many technical difficulties. We're doing good. I regret that I am the reason why we were delayed. I'm sure about all oh, one or two of our listeners were like, Where, where's the weekly episode? But, well, you know, but we've gotten the way. But here we are. We had to deal with our own enemies within. This is actually a, another one of my favorites. And I'm going to say, I get another one of my favorites. That's not exactly true. But this is actually a, a tour de force of pure William Shatner being twice the man he is. As he split apart Heck, uh, Jekyll and Hyde style in this uh, interesting episode. I, uh, it's the many ones I enjoyed. And since uh, you haven't seen this really either in further, before, what were your general impressions? Did you enjoy this episode? I loved it. I thought that it was a fantastic little slice of good old classic Trek. It's- yes, I was supremely impressed. And uh, oh, mm-hmm. yeah, no, it was, it was a better written episode than. A lot of TNG episodes, but a very TNG conceit. It is interesting. Uh, it, it was the splitting of a part. The actual writer, uh, Richard Matheson, said that he wanted to do something like Jekyll and Hyde. And I think he captured it well. We start off on the planet. After Run 77, they're doing some sort of geological survey. Send Yutz, tech, uh, geological technician, Fisher falls down and Yellow dust, when they beam up aboard the ship, the, he beams aboard the ship for an injury. It makes the transport of that guy wonky. And when they beam around Captain Kirk, first he comes, uh, comes up, and right before the commercial break, the evil Captain Kirk comes out. He's not really evil, but he's the mere first where the sides of rust, passion, command, decision ability comes out right there after. And we're not all ready. That's actually one of the more interesting concepts, and I think, unlike the last several episodes that we've seen, this deals more with, the, obviously, the duality of man. We're dealing with what actually makes one person a person. Uh, what makes Captain Kirk? Captain Kirk, you've got the more reasoned, comfortable side that we all like to show our faces, uh, our fellow man or fellow humans. Uh, and then you have the more passionate or angry side, if you will. The side that we turn to when we lose our, 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 lose our, our thin veneer of civilization, we get angry. Um, I thought, but, you know, I can say it, I've met my own you know, evil Matt Ross on occasion. I'm sure you've met your evil light Tom Tone on your own occasion. Did you like the way they handled it with the spinning of the transporter? Yeah, I thought it was very good. I, a classic transporter problem that would come up a couple of different times. Echoes of uh, future Star Trek, you've got, obviously, Thomas Riker being born out, out of a transporter hour that no one, no one even knew about him for seven years. That cut became a marquee and then died like a cluck, but that's fine. Well, either of these dead, either way, he in jail. I'm sure the Cardassians are treating him well. Oh, uh, thought, yeah, great. You, you, you get out of this seven-year-long isolated hellhole and you decide to become a freedom fighter against the one race that, well, I guess I'd rather be in a Cardassian prison camp than like a Romulan prison camp. But that's true. That, that, that's the uh, episode second chances in Star Trek The Next uh, Generation. And then uh, I forget the episode with, he was also in uh, the DS9 episode, uh, which was, uh, I had to Google it. But uh, uh, yeah. That was uh, a uh, obviously two Vic. right? Two Vic uh, where two Vic must die is my catchphrase. Uh-huh. Uh, but uh, the, there's also in the animated series, which eventually we'll hit to, get to. Uh, they uh, use the transporter to fix lots of things, but this is the very first thing, and something which you mentioned that on their way to uh, 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 leaning up from Alpha 177, which apparently can go down to 120 degrees. Uh, you asked me, how come they just didn't use the shuttlecraft? Well, I joked with you that we were watching the episode, we had the shuttlecraft were getting detailed and washed, but in reality, we're in 
think of shuttercraft, and also when they did take it eventually, it was a cross saving world to use a transporter, which is television effect, to build another set would have cost money. And, you know, TV and spending money uh, just don't go hand in hand. And Star Trek didn't have millions as it was. So, I was about to say, you've obviously got a continuity problem there as transporters weren't even around in Enterprise. The people. Well, that. They, you know, they had shutter prep, but the Enterprise didn't have it. So, you know, everyone said it was in a, it was in a shutter rush or, you know, they were putting the red stripes, uh, the racing stripes on the side or a star. I mean, they could have come up with any sort of headcanon. Maybe the atmosphere of the planet would not allow for a shuttlecraft to go down. By the way, that dog is so cute. I can't believe they get freaking killed in it. The horn dog? Yes, the horn dog. Very, <laughs> very Beautiful, very obviously unhappy about being under the hot lights and wearing this stupid costume. But I gotta say, this is uh, probably one of the, the, this is probably the first, first dogs that I've seen in Star Trek since the you old know, Puerthos. Yeah, this is, uh, but this was a space dog because it has a horn. Something also interesting is talking about costumes. If you think back to it, while they're on the planet, Shatner's command tunic does not have a command star and in fact when he beams up he still doesn't have the star i always thought there was an error in in the show well in a ring it is but apparently there was something to do with the cleaning of the uniforms they didn't have enough time to i mean cleaning in real life not on the ship they have time to sew on the command star again huh. uh, after i came back from the cleaners when they, you know on television you gotta get out Got to go up those 26 episodes a season. We only got like uh, six days per episode. They got time to race. So that's why it's not there. And it it is interesting. What's the deal with Star Trek with, with Kirk Garb? It, when he's on the bridge sometimes, he's wearing that, that more kind of casual, and his lean, soft tunic. And that's, I guess, when he's not in the away mission, right? Well, no, no. He actually wears it on away missions. I think the green tunic, which I actually read, the green wrap around it. I only worked like three, they worked like two or three times or three times in total. But I sort of remember from the color palette that the tunics only look yellow. They're actually supposed to be in a slightly greenish, but they came across through the lighting on the TV as yellow. But the reason why they gave him the green one is to tell him apart from his evil counterpart. That was the main reason for doing it. I still think that despite that separation to try and prove how they're different, I still think it works for well. Uh, uh, he comes back up to the ship, he changes, uh, but uh, uh, I guess it was quit as he uh, kind of passes out when he was like, yeah, and the man says, yeah, I worked on all this paperwork for you guys. Yeah, yeah, get out. But the other cook goes into sick bay and he asks for Sarah, why are you me? Give me the brandy. I thought that was hilarious. Or the, the Shatner was able to show the two different sides of him of himself. Over. Straight whiskey and violent lovemaking. Well, hey, nothing wrong with that. That's probably there yeah, actually yeah. a lot wrong with that. What oh, I was trying to write. Yeah, <laughs> whiskey. Yeah, okay. No, cancel, cancel. You're the, uh, but that's interesting. You had asked me, why does McCoy have booze in the sick bay? Well, you know, it's very for medicinal purposes, as you would say, but. He is the resident alcoholic. And that that's doctor at Seth, who's that kind of, that's Dick Rose Tennyson Whiskey from the 60s. Now it's a collector's item. I uh, myself have like a little tiny item version of it, like from uh, a convention I bought. It was like two bucks. Not a glass well, like a siren piece of like, I don't know, something. Tesla that looks like it. So that's a sawing brandy bottle. It's very. Uh, Iconic for Star Trek, and they use it all the way through. I think they used it on DS9 and TNG, and it comes from the Cheyennes, where we never see it, but where product is now real famous, even though it's just a redressed Acura whiskey bottle. I, I bet you were thinking, like, oh man, I gotta get me some of that. You can buy Dick West Tennessee whiskey, it just will not be in that bottle. I'm sure we can get a Pepsi and find one of those bottles. Oh, uh, you can find those bottles. Thank you. Let it you be. That's, uh, that's where they are. Uh, I think it's hilarious watching him walk through the hallway. He's just drinking it. No one's bothering him. Like, hey, Captain, I see you I'm, uh, turning into a uh, alcoholic freak. With the first ship of 430 personnel, I guess. Ah, let's stay out of the way of the captain. Uh, when I was, it's like he's having a rough day. Right. Um, and then, uh, but then again, we come back to the rivalry between McCoy and Spock right there after. 
seems like the doctor's having some of the errors, what he says. Kirk's at the comma card, or the after Kirk says to, uh, to Spock, but Spock says, you need, you need something. What do you think is he at the kind of like, the fact that, that Kirk says that uh, McQuarrie is picking on Spock all the time. You think McQuarrie hates Spock, or he's just being like that, a jackass? What do you think? No, I don't think that McQuarrie hates Spock. I think that uh, if McQuarrie didn't like Spock, he wouldn't talk to him. You know, ultimately, I think that he is a good old boy. He's a southern sawbones doctor, and he likes making a bit of fun with, uh, you know, with the resident nerd. I mean, also, <laughs> Spock can take it, too. It's, it's impressive. Imagine if you had someone who was a good friend who you could not hurt the feelings of, no matter what you did. Hmm. Yeah, you know, I like to say that about you, but, you know, I would never hurt your feelings. Mike, I love you. No, of course. It's, you know, in a brotherly way. Um, but, uh, uh, I did, I actually did write that nominate and the look of the moon that, uh, Spock has is an evening. And then we get into the fact that, uh, Mr. Red battle drinking Kirk goes into his yeoman's quarters. Oh, he's drinking. That's, uh, this is where we start an attempted rape. I got those scenes later. You were saying like you were surprised that they let that go on for so long. I was about to say, uh, why are they going to cut? Like, I, I, you know, <laughs> this is like 10 seconds too long here for modern t- network television. I mean, I you don't know. If you got to get tossed up there, Bucko. As you were saying, no one says that anymore. So there you go. But, you know, that's that's kind of an interesting scene. I always said that, uh, and I think it was... Uh, a young man said that uh, Shatner actually slapped her at one point to get her into the carriage of like fear or something like that. It was actually an exercise, not abuse. Uh, uh, so, uh, she was acting very well. Yeah, it was, it was really interesting. All right, before I forget, Lieutenant O'Hara is technically in this episode. We hear her voice. And you hear her voice. Also, Eddie Paskey, who was later as Lieutenant Leslie, was in this as, uh, I think it was his name was, uh, Connors, you'll see him again. I'll play him out later. He's like the longest serving third party character that no one really knows who the heck he is. He's also right of the body that was there. William Shatner, excuse me, the other one, I have to so switch my little man paper around there. Don Etme, he's also a body rebel in there. But that, that comes up later, but it's interesting that. They got people that look at Shatner from the back mostly for like uh, fast scenes or from distant scenes. I thought that the cinematography in this episode was excellent. There were some really good shots, like when they're looking for the double Sorry in, I that. guess, the the warehouse space. Yeah. You know, where the wherever the the, the deep uh, the old, inner the engineering session. session. Yes, the engineering session session, which I have to say actually. I always thought that it was very, the, the way J.J. Abrams shot the engineering was quite, you know, weird and not accurate. It's like, well, there's no rib clear here. What's going on? Why is it in this big brew rate? But looking at yes. the first episodes, I'm like, hey, it, it's much more totally consistent with um, the, the first episodes of TOS, what he was doing there, you know, with all the pipes. And I, think you, I, I, think you're think, I think you're thinking back to the ending of the 2009 episode with the acting step. Just that part is close to it, but that, that they are walking past various things. And the engineering deck gets its actual upgrade in uh, the motion picture, where they change everything around, and the Enterprise gets refit, and they have uh, this long room where a huge engine core. Um, but right now, you're just looking into a distance past that like, with uh, Aluminum uh, nutting or leather, and you could see like giant tubes pointing up in various ways to try and, you're not sure if that the impulse deck where it's a, a fusion reactor or that's the rip quick. It doubles as both. But yeah, that's where uh, Kirk goes to hide. And in those scenes, you get to see uh, the battery double from, uh, uh, from behind. Did you also mention the uh, uh, that you thought it was pretty close. They were, they were not uh, exactly the same size. I thought it was the, excellent. Yeah, the body double was a little bit buffer, but the way they yeah. shot it were, you know, in shadows, far away, not bad at all. I was very impressed. 
And the, yeah, again, the cinematography was fantastic. Like, you know, the long shot, the, the, the shadows, it was so much more interestingly designed than I get. I, again, I'm always comparing it to the nineties stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought it was much better than a lot of the cinematography that you would see in PNG and BS9 and certainly Voyager. That show was mm -hmm. so like a Pepsi commercial the entire time. <laughs> hey, what's the nineties? Well, I mean, it's like, hey, the, the, the gritty, you know, the gritty, we're lost in the far reaches of space. That's what I always couldn't stand about Voyager. It's like, man, the, these people look like they were sweating at the least of any crew I've ever seen. They're all perfectly manicured all the time. But uh, mm -hmm. anyway, moving on. Well, I mean, that's what put music too, as you were pointing out, that the music in this episode actually gave a good feeling for the uh, uh, scenes that they are in the darkness and also the melancholy nature of uh, the Saptor Kirk realizing he can't, uh, he's losing his ability to command. He's how uh, he's second guessing himself and also just sort of they're hunting down the darker uh, Kirk about kind of you got these violins and darker tones as they wrap around. It was, uh, very well done. The retro music was written by a guy named Sal Caplin, which you actually hear throughout the rest of Star Trek itself. It's some really good stuff that he's done there. I think it really, it actually really conveys the feeling of like a kind of a despair and sadness mm -hmm. for this character, for the character of Kirk in this situation. Uh, what did you think of the music? It was fantastic. I liked how it didn't like not like that. Lots of nice little riffs on the main team, going up to the more minor chords, putting it into a minor chord, very doom saying. By the way, just a little bit of crit criticism, I realized, like a couple of recent episodes, also the Naked Time. <laughs> naked Time? Let's get some Naked Time, baby. It was... Yeah. <laughs> there's, there was no explanation. Again, there's a conceit, and then it's, it's such a vague thing. It's like, uh, the, the or effed it up. I'm like, what, why, how, what happened? Hey, why couldn't we just take a, okay, you know, a, a vacuum, clean, vacuum cleaner and just kind of suck it out? Doesn't make sense. But, you know, it's, it's sci-fi. You have, that's the sci-fi concept. You, uh, it happens. You know, you go to space, weird crap happens to you all the time. You, you have, again, your naked time, or... Godlike powers because you hit got hit by a purple cloud, or you live on a planet with people you can't see or touch, you know? Well, you need sight suckers. Weird crap happens all the time, right? Well, that doesn't happen to you on your way to work? Come on. This is, this this is, 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 is a sitting stuff, right? It's a terrifying place. Yes. Did you ever see, did you ever hear of the book Red Shirts by John Scalzi? Actually, I have read Red Shirts by John Scalzi. I actually have it. It's a sitting across from me. That's the. Like the kind of parody of a parody. There's actually a Star Trek story. Uh, uh, I think it's close to like a strange land. It's not strange in a strange land by Robert A. Island. But uh, Return to a Strange Land, there was two short stories written and kid escaped to my mind right now. I'm sure the few <laughs> listeners that are listening will either comment or send in something. And please feel free to do that, everyone. Uh, to tell me which one that is, I do have that in the book too, where the actors get switched and sent to the original series universe. So kind of mirror, mirror, except it wasn't good versus evil, which we'll come to later, but actors replacing the stars that the uh, actual characters, which is where uh, Scalzi got his idea from, where the actual characters are then. You could also see that in kind of like Galaxy Quest, the unofficial Star Trek movie, or, uh, the Dark Miller episode, the Callis, USS Callister, which is Man, clearly a Star Trek episode. That was a great episode. I, I hate, you know, I can't stand the end that, that the end of like every Dark Miller episode is someone, not every single one, but the majority of them end the same way. Someone is trapped in a hellish limbo as a result of modern technology that they can never escape, that, you know, it'll, and it'll take their body you know, a day to die, but their mind will live out eternities. But well, I, doesn't, I agree with you. <laughs> which are just another reason why I refuse to get my brain uploaded if they do 
come out with some sort of life expanding technology where it's like, all right, we're going to put your brand into a computer. Are we just like you? I'm like, absolutely not, man. But like, so is, is that that curved. I don't care. I'll just, whatever. We're, we're all meant to die. You're yeah. not gonna, then you're not going to like Prue Anderson's Heat You Ever were then. Prue Anderson the book there where I don't know who all the folks are fan. I found these certainly called prayer fans that they could upload human consciousness into these things that were like storage devices. That's actually not their primary purpose. But you'll have to read the book by Prue Anderson as a series. And it's pretty good. I've seen you haven't read that. Prue Anderson also re- wrote on uh, a pale horse, right? Yes. Uh, he's, he's written a whole range of things, you know. But I like Pal Ho- on a pale horse quite a bit. I can't believe that it has not been made into a TV series or a movie yet. Well, a lot of books are very difficult to convert. I mean, look at Dune. Look at all the rest of it. And, uh, you know, there people, I'm sure. There are three adaptations of Dune. And I actually would dare argue that. Actually, uh, this Fuhrer. Oh, if you're talking about Yadorowski, the movie? Yeah, yeah. Which was uh, insane. Yadorowski's yeah. Dune is probably my favorite, second favorite documentary of all time. That's some weird crap. I'll tell you that much. That bit about your weirding way, man. Well, it's just about that's it. This is it's a beautiful, <laughs> uh, beautiful piece of cinema. Inspires you. You watch your essays too, and you want to go and write it, the novel you always thought about. But 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 that is sad. We should probably circle back to the episode because Fine. you know. Well, I was going to say that. Yes. 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 I was going to say that. Yes. 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 I got it. Yes. We clapped. We clapped when we heard him say it. <laughs> but they uh, shout out to Rich Evans on that one. <laughs> but yes, red shirts where they're like, "Hey, stay out of the narrative. You get close to this narrative, you're gonna get, you're gonna die." It's just that's true. Try not to talk to anyone. <laughs> it's like a a, a literary butterfly effect. Really? Yes. But uh, but that was actually it's actually pretty okay. Book uh, Red Shirts by Scarsy. Uh, I mean, I'm trying to get that one too. Who's there? Also get that. Uh, exactly. That Hitchi Rodney for Rest of the Galaxy Quest because we're going to be watching that one eventually as well. I love that. Uh, but but right well, when they confront Kirk or in the engine room or evil Kirk confronts good Kirk, some of the things in there behind him is this weird screen that's actually a piece of the conference room from. Uh, the uh, second pilot. Yes. Uh, and uh, Spock does something that is starts the entire franchise on Twitter. He creates the Vulcan nerve pinch. And that's the first time it's used. He didn't want to punch somebody. He actually uses the Vulcan nerve pinch on Kirk. That's the first time it was ever used in Thabav. Because meanwhile, I thought Spock is an alien. He's uh you know, he's different. His ways are different than ours. So he came up with this kind of alien thing, which says to there is a, a nerve in your neck that could actually hurt you pretty much. I don't know about knocking you out. I'm sure someone will say, yes, I can. But uh, that was uh, his creation. is a pretty good thing. I mean, Nemo came up with other things. We'll get to that as we go along. But that is actually when the, uh, that is the first thing. So we we have uh, no shuttlecraft, a Vulcan nerve pinch. And we got to do something after we've captured. Uh, uh, by the way, something we, we do have to go back a bit. The, this also has one of the best Shatnerisms of all time. When the evil Kirk is in his quarters, he shouts, I am Captain Kirk. It's one of the most iconic and most memed things on the internet. If you look it up, you'll find hundreds of memes and screams. Hey, it might accidentally be in this podcast. Who knows? But uh, what did you think of him like losing his cool as the evil Captain Kirk in the in his quarters? I loved it. I thought he looked great doing it. I thought the cinematography was good. I realized I've never really seen Shatner as a villain. I don't nothing to mm-hmm. mind. So it was nice to see this kind of dark side of him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's a, he's a, he's a good actor. Again, I, it's all this crap where people claim that he's like one note. Or that he doesn't have range. Like, yeah, he he doesn't have range in the way that, like, a method actor would have range. But he's an excellent character actor, which is he can convey a wide range of emotion while playing not too many different parts. You know, he's a, he's a, a, a Saturday, Saturday Night May Idol. He's a good looking guy. He's a very good actor doing it. Yeah, I also like the fact that, you know, I think he also has, he does have, portray that kind of 
Stoic hero pretty well, I think, overall in the series. I mean, to get some vulnerabilities for a character, unlike in modern Trek, where no one has any vulnerabilities except tools for everything. Uh, he is actually probably one of the better. I find him, well, he was my first captain, so to speak, because he was, he was the only game in town. But I will say that I actually, he's one of my favorite captains, actually. But I also think it's funny that in his quarters, he has heavy makeup for scratches that Janice Rand gave him while, while he was attempting to rape her. Uh, With that, stem that, cell powder. Yeah, yeah, sure it was. There was, it was cover up by Maybelline. No, but it was, it was pretty wild to see it. What are you having? You got a rabbit zits there, Cap? You know, or something. It was actually pretty neat. Um, that was the only way you could differentiate them from that besides the green shirts. Taking a step for Captain, by the way. Let's yes. go quickly down. We, we saw that little survey where we picked our own crew and ship. And uh, mine was Cisco, as it would be my captain. Spock would be my first officer. Holographic Doctor would be my, my physician. His name is Joe, ultimately, right? That's what he chooses. John, who knows? Okay. The doctor strikes it. Yes. The floors would be my engineer. Because he's a, he's a dedicated nerd who doesn't do too much outside of just working on his engine all day long. My bridge crew auxiliary staff would be Odo, Odwith, smart guy, versatile, Jadzia, generations of experience, quirk, good lateral thinking guy, sunny, probably making me a good drink and hook me up with some upgraded holodeck programs. To that, just because it's always, I think, good to round out with another Vulcan, stronger and smarter than the average person. And seven, eh, I don't know. Maybe I Yeah, that was to say, I didn't know it was going to be a quiz on that, Mike, so uh, I didn't actually write it down. I've got yours. Oh, well, then go ahead. Tell me what I said. And, and I would have, and I, my ship would have been Voyager. Okay. okay. It's smaller, more advanced, and I can land. I'm not. As you see, really read Janeway. That's not true. Can't say on that voice. <laughs> Matt is on. Does Hortaza know I'm in? Of course. Matt is Turk. Doc. So we both had the same. Also the doctor. I didn't realize that we uh, matched up this much. Daddy. Yeah. Then his uh, auxiliary staff was Odo, Dota, Sumu, Chekhov. I don't know why you do Sumu. And Chekhov. They're practically identical. Seven. I must. And he would choose yeah. the guy's E, which, what the hell? Well, now it's got, you well, know, it's got nice color tones and it can kick the ass of everything. That's it. That, that, oh. I don't know, man. Big, unruly, unruly thing worship. Hold on, let me just look at your smileage. I guess. Let me just quickly say it in my brother, my brother's chair. Sure. Oh, come on. Yeah. Joey, check this out. Pike, Ross, Bashir, Jody, Data 7, Garrick, Odo, Quark, and he would do the Enterprise D. I pointed out that it would be a horrible idea to have Garrick on your ship. Because he would have no secrets. Well, then clearly he's not a true Star Trek fan, then. He's banned from the show. No, I'm kidding. He would come on any time. Oh, Joe's, Joe's puts me to shame with his uh, Star Trek knowledge. Anyway, okay, that's that's so part. Back to the. Back to it. So we have to. We have to, uh, they figure out after realizing it, they just, you know, use some scratch tape that fix the uh, transfer. You know, it takes a week for the ionizer, which I guess, you know, that's for your hair. They decide to uh, do something with a craft circuit, blah, 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 blah. And they put the dogs, the horn dogs, the, uh, the evil horn dog that barks at everyone, and the soft, sweet, sensitive dog who just sits there. And they put it all together. They beam it up and it comes back dead. And we have another first. We have our very first. He's dead, Jim. From Dr. McCray. So they got, they got it all. Home. For the dab. For your horn dab, the dad. Uh, like, damn it. We can't beam the people up. Meanwhile, they're freezing to death on the planet. They're using phasers to heat up rocks. You know. And they're trying to burn the shed. There's no place for them to go. Things are breaking down, asking for cups of coffee and red, but then shuttlecraft would have been a great idea. Oh, well, 
They even had to shut her babe out of there in the back episode, back there of the ship. They just sort of get done. Ah, let's just use the transporter. But uh, I will share with Morales. Yeah, that's it. Sure, sure. That's, that's exactly it. Yeah. It, it had quantum tetra beams of something. Correct. That, but Bert Brad realizes, you know what? He's got to take himself back inside of me. There's a couple of rare, uh, Wave MP3 files that Kirk and Spock make and love to each other that uses that phrase. What has and it? if you want, what yeah, what is right. well, there's a whole red. You don't know about KS stories? Yeah, I why are you, why is, I heard of them. Why are you listening to them? You rock. I'm not a trick member, Brad, yet. Oh, I got lots of stress. <laughs> the bird, the bad, was real ugly. But I does that as a web file. If anything wants me, I'll just shoot me an email eventually. No, 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 no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go I'm going to put this on uh, Mike Steiner for his computer here, Revit. Um, but, uh, you know, there we do eventually get to the point where we have evil Kirk duping good Kirk uh, and uh, trying to do the part where the bad guy is pretending to be the good guy. I mean, they have it out on the bridge, but. Chris, I think you're going to uh, shout at a dozen because I want to lose. And he will, and they go back down to the transporter to reintegrate themselves. And does it work, Mike? Uh, can you believe it? It sure does. We don't end up with a psychopathic Kirk and, and you know, wood Kirk. You know, it's amazing that in the fifth episode of a 26 episode season or whatever, that. The main character whose name is on the marquee is not going to not make it in this uh, after episode five. Well, he does obviously make it. What did you actually think of the uh, the shooting of the devils on the bridge as compared to Asa on the transport? Did you still find it mildly believable between the two? Uh, no, I a little, a little worse. The hair is a little off, but um, yeah, yeah, no, not that at all. Yeah, it was pretty much enjoyable, I, I think. And uh, when we come to the, uh, I guess, the ending uh, of the episode, which is basically, uh, well, you know, okay, Jared? Yeah. <laughs> Beating those guys out. Hey, <laughs> bring them back up. Yeah, just having a chance by Billy Fad. I just throw them in the oven for 375, 15 minutes. These guys will be fine. So, well, uh, well, I'm down and. When we come to uh, the cringiest ep- part of the entire episode, which is what I pointed out. Right. So Matt seems to think that the cook, sorry, that Spock implies that, that Rad, I guess, wanted something naughty to happen. But my whole thing, too, is as I'm, as I'm reflecting on this, the whole point is that this is just letting out that the evil, quote unquote, evil cook. That's true. But, well, no, there was it wasn't it wasn't Kirk that didn't exist. It was just the part of him that was all eat, right? I mean, Gene Ronberry possibly was getting the pop science at the time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the sure he's on a dead to blow. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So the the point being that obviously he was the fact that he went after her in his unhinged state shows that he does have those feelings, that he does find her attractive, that he is attracted to her, and she is attracted to him. So now she knows that it's not just one-sided. She he didn't go running to someone else's quarters. So, you know, I think that was just kind of like her looking at uh, at it as a little encouraging to a crush, but a dark side of a, you know, potentially violent situation. Yeah, I, I, I always read it exactly as like Spack, a kind of in a jokey way, which is uncharacteristic, not characteristic of a red and say like, there's some things you like of that devil red for, and she gives him this kiss my ass look, which is pretty easy with those uniforms, but the, the, the things are gonna, you know, how short they're at. But I just think it's almost like, well, yeah, it's okay, red, red, that's the true animal sled that you want, isn't it, lady? In the prior episode, The Naked Time, there was a part where Kirk is actually pining the fact that he can't give himself over to Yeoman Land, so no beach to rock on, talking about a romantic time with his Yeoman, because he was also attracted to her, and that was actually written into the script, but that actually goes nowhere for the series. It's not really a spoiler. We'll see that as it goes along, and 
that Yemen Rand isn't in the entire series. She does come, Grace Lee Whitney is actually fired later, but she is, does come back in several other things. And like I said, I met her. She was actually a pretty nice person when I met her, but no, I did not say, I'd like to walk on a beach with you. Uh, she, uh, uh, I think kind of, it was implied that she write the more forceful code in some way. But I think when you take it with the scene together, it does got to have an extreme negative reaction. It was to me in a way. It's like, yuck. That's kind of pretty sleazy there, Mrs. Spock. But that's just my opinion. So overall, there, uh, that's pretty much where the episode ends. And we go ahead, rope for to two. I'll go to our next little adventure. Uh, what do you think of this episode overall? I I, I I don't know if I would, uh, would you say, would you recommend watching it for a Star Trek movie or what would you say? Yes, 100%. This is probably the best original series episode I've seen so far. Uh, I give it a 9 out of 10. Excellent. I also give it a 9 out of 10. So uh, we we'll have to keep track of all of our numbers. We had a lot of sevens, but uh, 9 out of 10 for me as well. What's your WTF moment for this? Because if you can't tell, that is my WTF moment response is you like the Adam Miller stick bird. That's for me. It was like, really? But what was yours? Did you have one? Where were you two enamored with the dog? The dog. The, the scene with the dog in the beginning. That was pretty <laughs> out of left field, man. What did it do to this poor dog? You, well, you don't like that ever? You're, gonna, you're not going to get it for your dad, Canola? You're not going to get one? You're going to get an outfit like that? No, of course not. I think between your two dogs, I think you had both of those dogs. The evil, vicious dog that tries to kill everybody on your sweet staff dog. You'd rather know two different animals. Uh, one being your uh, oh, wife, one being yours. That's good. Sad of this either, gotta say. Oh, yeah. But uh, I think uh, Kanela can wear that uniform too. Kanela is a what? What is she? A Shih Tzu? Uh, Shih Tzu mixed with a Pomeranian. Uh, and your demon dog is what? Is, well, Zelda's a very sweet dog. And Taz, she has, she is a hound, Bassett, mixed a little with a husky and something else. Yeah, it's sort of barbell, I think. Okay. She's so <laughs> sweet. She lets me pick her up now. She's really, really wow. sweet pie. And, and he only has eight fingers left, folks, so finally played off. Good and job. So that, uh, that was our episode. Anything else you'd uh, like to mention or talk about? Uh, are you no, excited I mean, for the... It's- uh, it's gotten better. I can't wait to see where it goes. It seems like it's pretty astonishing that after only five episodes, it's really in its stride. Uh, I'm very impressed. Yeah, it, it was pretty amazing that the uh, first episode, uh, the first season was so fantastic. But when you look at other uh, sci-fi shows, not just Trek, it usually takes a season or two or three to get its feelings, and sometimes newer cities uh, don't, I mean, that it's feelings, it's stride, and some newer cities don't catch its stride at all. But our next episode's coming up, and we're trying to get it up uh, next week, we promise, barring any weirdness. No, it's not me, and I'm, fr- I'm much more through this weekend. I don't really remember that. We're going to try and get this out next week, but the next episode is Mud's Women, which is the episode of... Base wives, where rose to better than we're proud of you. Hey, <laughs> you don't say it. I ain't doing now that. But uh, that's basically it. So, whoever enjoyed our episode of uh, Letting Your Gases and Mallow, Mike, you want to uh, yeah, send us out again? That's the end, guys. Yes. All right, right, right. Thank you again for joining us at uh, Growing the Gaseous Anomalies, and we'll see you in the next round. Live well and prosper, Mike. Love you, Matt. Bye. 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 Bye.